Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It, uh, we took a week off for Pesach, but we're back live and we're also recorded and also available as a podcast on Apple Podcast. Today is my great pleasure to welcome Tzvika Klein. Tzvika, for Chicagoans, know him as a Chicago, and he was born in Chicago. His parents, grandparents were in Chicago. Uh, and it's, uh, I remember those days as well. But most importantly, Tzvika is one of the great Jewish journalists in the world today. He is the Jewish world analyst for the Jerusalem Post. He formerly was a correspondent from a correspondent from a Korishon and for the Ma'ariv. And many people were introduced to Tzvika about seven years ago when he wrote an article called 10 Hours of Fear and Loathing in Paris and a video that went viral, which just showed what happened when he walked with a kippah through the streets of Paris and the reactions. In fact, Tzvika, after that video, my wife commented to me that we're not going back to Paris. But I still <laughs> welcome you to this, to KINS, to Daytime Dialogues, and thank you for giving us your time today. Welcome thank to Thank you, uh, Rabbi Matenki. It's an honor to be here, and I say Chicago, but I don't know enough to say that I'm really a Chicagoan, but I could try and play the part at times. Well, as long as you say Chicago and that on top of a house is a roof, we're doing okay. Roof, I don't know. I don't do rough. <laughs> oh, Chaval, <laughs> almost, almost made it. So there is so many things that are happening in the Jewish world today that uh, I want to touch on a few of them with you and let's see where it all goes. And the top on the list is really the crisis because of Ukraine. Um, there are somewhere projections, somewhere about 40,000 halachic Jews, about 200,000 Jews by the definition of Chok Hashfut, of the law of return. Many of them are refugees. One thing you don't know is that before Pesach, KINS paid for 10,000 um, meals for the first Seder for the Jews who were refugees. So it's something that's very close to all of us. What's happening now in Israel with the refugees? Right, so um, <clears throat> so first of all, again, thank you for having me. Um, there, that we this week uh, passed the uh, 15,000 who came to Israel. Um, so we're talking about more than 15,000 Olim, um, which is not only Ukraine, it's Ukraine and Russia, um, and a little bit from Belarus. Um, most of these Olim are from Ukraine, but I get, I get excuse me, I get the, the numbers every day. Every day they send out these numbers about who, uh, how many Olim came. And in the past few, I would say past week or two, um, almost every day there's like, between 100 to 200 Olim that come every day just from, from these countries. Um, and at least half of them, if not more, are from Russia, uh, which is fascinating to see, um, you know, even though Russia is, you know, the, the country that's attacking Ukraine, but the Jewish community there is in a very difficult situation. Um, in general, the, the situation in Russia is is difficult. Um, so many of the Jews are, are interested in Aliyah. There are, at least, I would say, 3,000 more who already have been approved or semi-approved uh, to make Aliyah from, from Russia in the next few weeks. Um, and it's going to keep on growing. Um, so basically, um, uh, many so 15,000 uh, of these Olim arrived in Israel. Some of them arrived not as at Olim, actually, but as, um, as uh, tourists. And then they continued their Aliyah process in Israel because um, the idea was to get them to Israel as fast as possible. Um, I find it amazing that there are 43 hotels around Israel that um, these old Olim kids stay in. Um, I was actually yesterday, I'll give you a, sne a sneak peek because I didn't write the article yet. It's for Friday, but yesterday I was at one of the hotels in Jerusalem, the Grand Court Hotel. Um, and there's a group of, let's say, 100 Olim from Ukraine. There, I spoke to two women who have been living in that hotel for a month, and it's all paid for by the Israeli government. It's three meals a day. Um, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's the fanciest hotel, but I had, you know, it was fine. Uh, um, so I think, you know, that's definitely an amazing thing. Um, so if I could stop you for a second. So the yeah. hotels are taking the place of what had once been absorption centers, Merkaz Klita. And uh, so that's the thing, because there's not enough space 
for all, I mean, you have 50, 15,000 people that came um, in, in two months. Now, on a, before COVID, I think we're, there was like 30,000 Olima a year from all countries around the world. Okay, so and obviously most, I mean, most of them don't go to America to these, right, to these absorption centers. Um, uh, but so you have a situation where you have no space. And also the question is what happens after this month, let's say, or a few weeks. So it's it's a big deal because there are, there, as I said, there's no room in these uh, centers. And if you're a refugee, you know, we'll pay rent. So um, these Olim get special benefits more than the average, uh, the, the regular Ole. They get money for rent, at least for a year, if not more. And I think there's different discussions about housing. So, I mean, I think potentially just like the Russian Olim back, you know, back in the day and the Ethiopian Olim will get like substantial amounts of money um, to get some sort of apartment or be, be given an option, whatever, to live there because uh, we don't know. I mean, again, the, the numbers will continue. And but the question is how like the, the numbers now are not as big as they were. Um, but, you know, it's it's an ongoing thing. And it's interesting before we started this conversation, it's like you ask, like, what's going on with Ukraine? And it, it's it's it, it, we, we also spoke about media cycles and, you know, it's just like people got, got bored about it because the whole world was following. And I think that's what everyone really wanted to do something. And just, you know, your synagogue did stuff um, and, and many others did. Um, it's just hard for people sometimes to 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 maintain I don't know attention to things that are happening for a long time, but um, you know the, the the situation still is that the Russians are still bombing and still trying to take over Ukraine. Um, I would say most of the Jews that wanted to leave left. Um, there are still every other day I see a group of Holocaust survivors that are been being saved and taken out. Um, you know, and it's very symbolic because this evening. We're starting Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day here in Israel. Um, so it's it's definitely ongoing, and it's interesting to see that also there are many Jews who are not going to Israel. Um, some of them are staying in the neighboring countries, and it's interesting because these neighboring countries have very small Jewish communities, and there's a potential for them to like double the amount of Jews there. So it's 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 interesting. So the Sochnut is the Sochnut, The Jewish Agency is working. The the joint, the JDC is working. Are is Israel on the ground in Ukraine? In any yes, way? yes. I mean, first of all, there's the hosp the hospital, right. the Goldomir Hospital, um, with uh, with you know medical uh, personnel and and volunteers. Um, the Jewish Agency was not in Ukraine for a while, but went back into Ukraine in certain areas. JDC is also in Ukraine. Um, also, many of these organizations have local workers. So, it, it, you know, they're not just Israelis working there. They could be Ukrainians uh, working there. And one thing we didn't mention is, you know, there, all these families are, are split apart because men can't leave if they're at the age of 18 to 60, um, unless, by the way, they have three children or more. Most of them don't. I actually met a few families that do. Um, so, so all these, you know, there's mostly uh, olot. They're mostly female, you know, immigrants to Israel and children, um, and not as many men. And in terms of what's happening with them, are they setting up panim, or is it still too early? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually learned yesterday that not only are there regular ulpanim, but I interviewed this um, nurse a young nurse, and she said there's actually a medical ulpan, which is fascinating that, like, there's actually, you know, an ulpan according to your profession. I don't know if there's more than, you know, other professions, but something that could help because they have to go through some sort of an exam, um, et cetera. So there are many ulpanim around the country. Um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, a will and try, I think, we're trying in a way, even though we're not very good at planning and doing things in an organized, to learn from what, from the many mistakes that were in the 90s with the Olim that came from Russia and to try and do it in a better way. Um, and also the fact that there are a million 
um, there are a million Russian speaking Jews in Israel or Russian, you know, Russian Olim uh, in Israel makes the whole situation different. We're able to accept them in a better way than we could in the 90s when there was barely any Russians in Israel. Um, now, in terms of politically in Israel today, you know, Israel has been trying to walk that narrow road of of keeping relationships with Russia and, and keeping relationships with those who are opposed to it, you know, those who are supporting the Ukraine. Is there any kind of political football in terms of the Olim or is everyone on board with the Olim coming to Israel? Are any of them, is there any back and forth? I don't know, is Avigdor Lieberman saying it should be this way and Lapid is saying it should be this way and Bennett saying it should be that way? There always are <laughs> those situations, but it's not, it's not with like the bigger picture. Like the bigger picture, everybody agrees on. Everybody agrees upon the fact that we need to help, that we need to bring them in, that we need to give them, you know, the most, you know, the best, um, I don't know, um, uh, what the word is, uh, uh, best housing and, and help with education and food, et cetera. Um, it's more in like the smaller things of, will this group get to stay in the hotels or will they not? Or are the Russians and Ukrainians getting the same amount of, of money for, because, you know, are you, are the Russians considered uh, uh, refugees? You know, it's, it's a big question and not everybody agrees upon it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any others, but, you know, it, it's more on like the little things of, of, of how it's being done. But in general, I would say on this topic, at least, there's pretty much a consensus, which is a, a very big deal in Israel. Now, it's interesting. Yesterday, the ADL in the United States released a report about the rise of anti-Semitic incidents in the United States. It's, it's risen over 30 percent from last year. Right. Has that created any waves in Israel? Is Israel taking notice of that? So I always say there's two things that the Israeli media and Hebrew um, like uh, report about the diaspora. It's anti-Semitism and Aliyah. Um, and both of them are kind of something that strengthens the like traditional Zionists um, ideology or view where it's like, okay, you know, they didn't make Aliyah, you know, so this is what's happening. I mean, it's not, it's not said out loud. It's kind of, again, this is my analysis on what, you know, uh, many editors I had throughout the years, um, but it's also, I guess, you know, news is usually something negative happening, right? So it's definitely news. So yes, it was very, you know, um, very um, noticeable in Israel and, you know, all the news uh, outlets uh, publish it. By the way, every year, every year, um, there's, there's different anti-Semitism reports and they always get like very high up on the news. Um, and it's funny, just the way you said about France and your wife saying, we're not going to go to France. So, you know, people also then said, oh, is it safe to go to France? And I said, well, you live in, in Jerusalem. Is it safe to live in Jerusalem? You know, I mean, it's, there are, there are you know, situations occasionally. Um, so, um, there, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely here. And, and during the, the days before and, and on Yom HaShoah, one of the topics that are always discussed in the Israeli media is really anti-Semitism um, and how, how you know, and, and I think this year with you, with what happened in Ukraine, um, there's definitely that feeling where everyone thought it could never happen again. Again, it's not a Holocaust, what's going on in Ukraine, but millions of refugees in Europe is, is, is a big deal. And in Israel itself, is it, is it, uh, some kind of a cause of saying, hey, there's a triumphalism, you better come, we're going to do more in Chutz Laaretz. It's not just in the United States, it's all around the world, or is it just, okay, this is the latest proof that what we're doing is right. Is there, do you see any kind of movement to try to move American Jews or Jews from elsewhere to, to increase the Aliyah because of anti-Semitism? All the time. I mean, I, uh, most of the comments... Um, for, of what I wrote or write in Hebrew, now I mainly write in English, um, was what are they doing there? Make Aliyah. Like that, that's the average. And again, I also say, there, you know, I don't know many people today that actually write comments 
on our articles. So it may show the type of people that write this, but but definitely, you know, many people respond. So why don't they make Aliyah? You know, um, and but they don't really understand anything deeper than there was an anti-Semitic attack in Chicago, right? They don't hear about the Jewish life there. And, and, and by the way, the same thing with Ukraine. I mean, I've been covering the Jewish world for 11 years and I worked for Jewish organizations before that. So I've been in Ukraine many times and I know that there is a real Jewish presence and Jewish life in Ukraine, that the largest JCC uh, in the world was in Ukraine. Um, but people don't, you know, again, we have you know, very short attention spans and we're all living our lives. But, um, you know, there's an amazing Jewish life in Chicago, just as there was in Ukraine. And they're very different Jewish lives. But in Israel, most most uh, don't know it. And actually, the AJC poll that you mentioned, um, one of the interesting questions was um, they asked millennials in Israel and in the U.S. and the American Jewish community um, about Israel diaspora relations. And they asked the Israelis, how do you see diaspora Jews? And over 50% said distant relatives. Um, and a lot lower, like I forgot, was between 10 or 20, uh, was like sec uh, first cousins, siblings, brothers, things like that. So like uh, those, those were very low. And the highest was distant, distant relatives, meaning most you know young Israeli, I guess young is whatever, millennials are my age too, but um, see uh, diaspora Jews as, as like, distant relatives. It's not even first cousins, you know, it's not. So that, um, that, so. that parallels the Pew study in terms of America, the millennials view of Israel, that it's not as high on the agenda and it's. Right. But I don't, I don't remember all, I'm, I'm a pretty uh, big Pew nerd. I don't remember the exact, the exact uh, parallel. Again, it's not the, it's not the exact question because it's like how important is, is Israel to your Jewish identity. And actually in this poll, it was pretty high. I think it was over fifty percent, maybe like sixty percent. I'm not. I'm not sure, but um, it, it's a different. I, I would say. I think in the parallel group, they would see Israel as. You know, I don't. Know, maybe I'm wrong. No, it may. By the way, it may just be an issue of millennials. Millennials don't join in natural groupings. It's more transactional relationships. It could also be that people who are a little older than you are and the millennial group. Let's say your parents, who are a little older than I am, oh, I'll remind them. Yeah. Okay, they, you know, when we were growing up, it was always important to be part of B'nai Akiva, to be identified with groups. And nowadays, that same sense of identification doesn't occur. And maybe it's the same thing in terms of being identified with world jury. Maybe it's right. just your own little corner. Right, it could be. Um, it's interesting, I actually interviewed um, Rabbi Ari Berman. Um, for one of our Pesach uh, magazines. And he his his view was that the whole issue of like streams in North American Jewry is is an is a, is an issue of the past. He's like, you know, the, the the young generation that he actually meets every day in the YU campus um, isn't doesn't go according to these terms. And you know, I mean conservative Judaism is becoming less. But you know, those people are, are going somewhere, right? So where are they going? Are they going to be modern Orthodox? becoming reform or others just doing their own thing. So I think it's definitely, there is a generational thing there, uh, definitely. Um, but um, it's, 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 it's an interesting topic. So you're writing now for the Jerusalem Post. I, how does it, how is it different than write, besides language for writing from Ariv or Makori Show? You know, when I go to Israel, I'll buy for Shabbat, I'll buy the Jerusalem Post because it's easy to read. I'll buy Yediot, I'll buy whatever the papers are available, the Israeli papers as well. I'll read the articles. And I always wonder how the slant is different, how they present same things in different ways. What have you discovered between the two? Well, first of all, I don't have to um, be, um, I feel like I'm a, what's in Hebrew I say metif, um, like a preacher, okay? Um, in Israel, I was always, I felt I always had to um, argue and convince my editors and also the readers why what I was writing was important or why they should notice diaspora Jews because 
it's important. For the Jerusalem Post, it's like, this is like a major part of, not only of what of is and what they think about, but also, you know, it's also the source of income of the paper is, is from, you know, these big Jewish organizations or, you know, or companies. So um, you know, what I'm, so I can write about almost anything I want because there's someone listening. Um, I feel that there is more, there are more and more Israelis that are interested in, 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 in hearing what's going on in the diaspora. It needs to be um, delivered to them in a different way. Like you have to be very creative in finding stories that will be able to, to get, you know, I had many times where stories I wrote from a Korishon were followed up by you know, national television, radio, you know, all the time. But you need to make sure that, you know, for that to happen, it can't just be like, I don't know, a JCC did a nice Purim party. You know, it's got to be, it's got to have an angle to it. Yeah, but the angle's got to be very <laughs> unique, or, or I don't know, or, or, or dramatic. And do you find in, in Israel itself an understanding of diaspora jury? Or is, whether they're interested or not, do they understand? Most don't understand. Um, Speaker, you just froze for a moment in the conversation. Hopefully you will come back on in a moment. While Tzvika is frozen, let me just add a couple of things and we'll see if he comes back. And if he doesn't, then unfortunately we'll have to stop at this point. But one of the things that we haven't spoken about until now is that Tzvika is also going to be writing a weekly column on Fridays that's going to be distributed by the RZA, the, Miz the National Mizrahi, and also in Chicago, particularly by our local Chicago Mizrahi. It was an effort that was put together by our own Rabbi Gerald Eisenberg, together with Rabbi Ari Rakoff in the national office, and we we're looking forward to reading those as well. Uh, Tzvika um, also didn't mention at the same time as well that some of the issues that happens with Israeli Jews and their understanding of American jury is because the distance and it's so very different. And so I hope he'll come back on if he doesn't. Uh, we'll give it another 10 seconds before we close this session, but I uh, do hope he does come back on. Finally, in the last couple of seconds then, while we're waiting, just to remind everyone that next week we will be having as a guest, Rabbi Moshe Hauer, the executive director, the chief executive officer of the Orthodox Union. All of these daytime dialogues are archived on the KINS website, and also all of them are available as an Apple podcast. I thank everyone for joining us. We're going to have to do a second part with Svika to pick up and hope that the connection will be better in the future. I thank you all. Have a very good day.